Welcome to Living in the World International Church. We are here as in doers of God's Word, with signs and wonders following. If you want more information about our ministry, visit us at www.litweek.org or email us at info at You will never be the same again. Now it's time to listen to God's Word from Pastor Femi Alaren. Be blessed as you listen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to our midweek service for this week. Um, I'm so excited. This is the last Wednesday of the month of April. Thus far, the Lord helped us. He has been faithful throughout the year. Four months of the year has gone and God himself has shown himself strong on our behalf. Preserving our lives, preserving our homes, our destinies and everything that pertains to us. Uh, we have been studying about the blood of Jesus Christ in the month of April and we have been given access to the spiritual weapons that have been given unto us um, for spiritual battles. Um, in our midweek series we have been looking at um, the subject tied to weapons of war. Today we shall be looking at the communion, communion, the communion. Uh, many of us know about the communion, um, the blood and the flesh of Jesus Christ. Many of us have been partakers of it since the days of our youth. I'm so excited about bringing the topic to you right now, today. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We exalt you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for thus far you have helped us. You are a good God, a loving Father. There's no one like you, the ancients of days. Thank you for dying on the cross of Calvary for us. Thank you for redeeming us out of darkness into your marvelous light. My Father and my God, the King of Kings, as we sit at your feet to learn, I ask that you open our eyes of understanding and you reveal the mystery of communion unto us. And I pray by the end of the service that each and every one of us shall have testimonies to the glory and praise of your holy name. Thank you, my Father. Blessed be your mighty name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. Let me ask you a question. If a new convert comes into the church or comes into a building where Christians are gathering and he sees them having a communion or having communion which is part of our uh, um, doings within the Christendoms and he asks a question why do you do it what would your answer be some people might say well we have always done it this way others might say because it reminds us of Christ some others might also say that um because we are Christians, and that's why we are having communion. Yes, yeah, so unbelievers have communion too. Does that make them Christians? So why do you have communion? We might need to answer that question in depth and understand it fully so that we can begin to um, appropriate what is in the communion into our lives and begin to enjoy the benefit thereof. Now the Bible tells us many reasons why we have the communion and some of it we are going to explore today within the time that we have. But before we begin there, let me quickly share with us a little story I read about a little girl that went forth to her mom and said, Mommy, you're roasting meat. He said, why do you cut off the ends of the meat? And the mother told the little girl, he said, little girl, because um, we allows the meat to absorb the spices and the flavor from the um, pan. And then, uh, not satisfied by the mother's answer, she went to her grandma, who was in the house also. And um, grandma said, well, yeah, I don't really know. I just cut off the end of the meat because I've always seen Nan do it, which is a great grandma. And so that we, I think, but because he allows the meat to absorb the spices, still not satisfied because it was the same answer that mother gave her. She now went to Nan and said, Nan, why do you cut off the end of the meat before you put it inside the pan? He said, Mom, Mom told me and Grandma told me that you cut off the end of the meat because you want to absorb the juices within the pan to allow the meat to be more flavored. And the, gram, the Nan laughed and said, well, I used to cut off the ends of the meat because my pan was not big enough to, to occupy the meat I was trying to roast. So and the reason I cut off the ends of the meat. Likewise, many of us do things in life. We have traditions and habits and rituals that we do, but we really don't know why we do them. Many of us have been following the bandwagon effect because we have seen those who are before us do them or do them, and then we simply do it because we feel um, we should do them too. Now, 
let me say that communion is not just a ritual that we perform weekly or a snack that we have at the church. It's a lot more than that. As a matter of fact, it's the foundation for the new covenant. Jesus said in the books of Matthew 26 verse 28, I said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So the communion has great historical um, background to it and also has great virtue to it and also it has great spiritual meaning to it. Communion is perhaps the most expensive meal in history because it costs somebody's life to actually provide that meal for each and every one of us. Now, let me try to define communion from a natural point of view, then I give you a spiritual definition. Now, just as we eat food to nourish our body, many of us take in regularly a balanced diet, so we also need spiritual food to nourish our spirit man. Just as we eat food, physical food, we also need part. I know about people who say the word of God is the food of the spirit. Yes, that's true also, but most of us, sometimes we eat fruits. We eat other things as well, not just eat raw food. If you eat carbohydrates without adding some protein to it and some vitamins to it and all kind of things to it, you don't have a balanced diet. So part of the balanced diet that we have as Christian is the communion that enables us to have a complete meal within the spiritual realm. So the communion is a spiritual meal that nourishes our spirit. If you can put it that way, I think that will be a simple understanding or simple definition that each and every one of us can um, um, acknowledge. Let me tell us this also as a sign of warning that we don't take communion because everyone else is doing it. It's not, it's not something that everybody else is doing so I must also do. We do not partake of the communion when we don't have an understanding because my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. That's what the Bible says. We cannot appropriate the spiritual meaning and understanding of it. We do not partake of communion because our parents are doing it also. Many of us have taken communion because our parents, are, we have seen them eat the flesh and the blood, not really have an understanding of what is. We don't partake of the communion because we are hungry or thirsty. I see if you read the books of Corinthians as well, 1 Corinthians as well, you see where Paul was rebuking the church in Corinth, talking about why are you taking, don't you have homes where you can eat and drink? Why must you come to the church and get drunk? Now, we don't partake of the communion when we are not right with the Lord and when sin is paramount in our lives and when we have no personal relationship with Him. And we don't partake of the communion simply to look good in front of others, maybe our friends or whatever, so that we don't eat unto damnation. Now, the communion is essential as a part of the balanced diet that God has provided for all the saints. Each and every one of us must be a full partaker of the communion if you are a bona fide child of God. This is what gives us a balanced diet. Communion is much more than a religious tradition. It's not a midweek service snack like I said earlier. We cannot be full partakers of Christ until we have partake of his flesh and his blood. The communion signifies our allegiance to Christ who is the author and the finisher of our faith. It unites us to the head of the church which is Jesus Christ himself. I would like to give us a few benefits why we we'll take the communion or one of the mysteries or some of the mysteries behind the communion. And as you begin to listen I pray that your eyes of understanding will be open in the precious name of Jesus Christ. As partakers of Christ, I mean as partakers of the flesh and his blood, we are imparted with his nature with a spiritual nature. We are no longer spiritually inferior because every free inferiority, inferiority complex disappears from us. The blood is our paternity access to the Lord, to God. We know that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. That each and every one of us will become bona fide children of God. So the communion is an access to the almighty God imparting his nature into us. And every form of inferiority complex is destroyed. Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees of his days because he often called himself the Son of God. And because he is the only begotten Son of God, we also are now begotten of God because we are born of not the will of the flesh. We are born of not the will of man, but of the will of God. John chapter 1 verse 13. Now I read the scripture in the books of 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. And I would like to read it to you. He says this, he said, whereby are we given unto 
exceeding great and precious promises, that by this ye might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. <laughs> the Bible makes us understand that for the everything in, this, in the everything in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Communion is a way to deal with the sin of the flesh, especially the lust of the flesh. Because once we are partakers of divine nature through the communion, what is in Christ comes into us. What God hates becomes what we hate. That's one of the key reasons why we eat the communion. We become like as if Christ was living on earth. There was no record that Christ fell into immorality while he was on earth. And I believe that the women will have been trolling him left, right and center. People coming towards him every corner trying to seduce him. After all, the Bible said that he has been tempted in every way that we have been tempted. But because we are partakers of the communion, what Christ hates becomes what we hate. Sin not becomes um, something we wrestle and fight against anymore. It becomes something that we walk over. Because we are beginning to see things as Christ did. His nature is imbibed in us through the communion. That's why we become partakers of divine nature. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life become the things of the past. Number two. The Holy Communion is for our health and our wellness. We eat balanced diet for a healthy body. We need a spiritual diet to maintain a spiritual and healthy spiritual body. Whenever the medical uh, practitioners want to diagnose a patient, they do a blood test to see what could be wrong with him. There's no scripture that tells us that Jesus Christ was once sick. And once we begin to partake of his nature, of his body and his flesh, then what cannot be found in Christ in terms of sickness and diseases cannot be found in us. Because we are now subscribing to the same health plan that Jesus Christ had in the communion. So each and every one of us, as we are becoming partakers of the communion, we are restoring our health to the fullness level which God has, in, um, has intended for us to be. We understand from the Old Testament that there are types and shadows of things to come. Now the Bible talks about Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, who blessed the patriarch Abraham and gave him a communion. The Bible reads in the books of um, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 20, 20. Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Now the Bible says there, it said, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, God, Abraham of God most high, possessor of the heavens and of the earth, blessed be the God of most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave a tithe of all that he had. Now, what am I saying here? He gave him bread and wine, which is significant in terms of communion. Because remember, on the, at the last supper which Jesus Christ had with his disciples, he gave them the bread and wine to drink. And the Bible records there that Abraham was refreshed. He was strengthened. In other words, he became well again after having an authority day. So for those who are feeling weak in their body, I would recommend the medication called communion. So that you begin to be refreshed in your spirit man. Remember, when your spirit man is not broken, your body cannot be broken. The Bible tells us clearly in the books of Proverbs that our spirit man, he said a, a, a strong spirit will sustain a man. He said a broken spirit, who can bear? So we are beginning to see this from the scriptures. And you can read more about Melchizedek in the books of Hebrews, especially Hebrews chapter 7. And we begin to look at verse 3. He says, without father and mother, without genealogy, without beginning of the days or end of days, resembling the son of God. He reminds us of a priest forever. He, reminds, he remains a priest forever. He said, without beginning of days or without the ends of life, resembling the Son of Man, he remains a priest forever. That's talking about Melchizedek. Each and every one of us can be strong by the communion. If we are genuine partakers of it, because we are partaking of the flesh and the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, what else is in the communion? Now, I would like to break it into two and we we'll look at the flesh first, which is the bread. 
Now, there's a story of an, uh, about Jesus Christ and some group of men. They were walking after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and resurrection of him. They were walking and they were going towards the town and the city. And Jesus Christ joined them and he was talking with them. And he was talking about the scriptures. And the Bible records, if you read the books of Luke 24, from verse 28, there down was to about 31. The Bible records there, say, as they approached the village to which they were going, said Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is near evening. The day is almost over. So he went into the, he went into the stay with them. When he was about at the table, he took bread and gave thanks. Remember, he took bread and gave thanks, similar to what he did in the books of um, um, Luke, when he was breaking the bread at, last, at the Last Supper, and broke it, and began to give to them. He said, then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. In other words, when you are a partaker of the flesh, the bread, you become divinely illuminated divinely illuminated what does that mean you begin to see things as christ see things the eyesight that was blind before your spiritual eyesight that was blind before you begin to see clearly the bible says in the books of luke 24 verse 12, 45 he said then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures you see some people read the bible and it kills them it kills them for the bible kill it the bible uh, the scripture says so when you begin to read the scriptures, it's not just men's stories to you anymore. It becomes something that gives you divine inspiration, divine illumination, divine revelation. It transforms your life. It changes your story. It moves you to a new pedestal. It moves you, accelerates your journey in life. So the communion is just not a snack that we have at the Sunday service or ritual that we perform. It has deep spiritual connotation within it that pertains to life and godliness for each and every one of us. We must understand this and begin to appropriate it. Now we go further down, we look at the blood separately. Now the Bible makes us understand clearly in the books of Luke, oh sorry, Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. It said, for the life of the creature is in the, is in the blood. The life of the creature is in the blood. What does that mean? If you read the books of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, it said, how much more then will the blood of Jesus Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleansed our conscience from act that leads to death, so that we may be to serve the living God. You see, when we are taking the blood, we become a partaker of his nature in terms of life. The new life is in us. Not only that, we are also empowered to serve. Not only that, we are strengthened and we are purged from evil conscience. You see, some things we usually do when we were not born again becomes irritating, uh, irritation to us now that we are born again. Why? Because we are now partakers of divine nature. We are now purged. Our conscience is now purged. So it requires that when we are taking the blood, we begin to imbibe the presence of God into our system. I remember this. The story of... Um, is it John G. Lake now? He was in South, South Africa and there was an epidemic. While the epidemic was going on, he was busy laying hands and praying for people. And people got to be curious about him and said to him, how come you're not catching this disease? Or aren't you scared of dying of this disease? And he said to them, he said, uh, the, the blood has punched us. I'm a partaker of a new life that is in Christ Jesus. I can't be dying of diseases that others are dying from. So they decided to do a test. They took some of the, the saliva from the dead corpses of people who have been killed by the epidemic and they put it under a microscope. They saw them alive and well and kicking. So they put it upon the hands of John G. Lake. And then they took it after some time. They put his hand under a microscope to check the condition of the organisms or the bacteria or the virus, whatever it might be called at that point in time. And they found that none of them were living anymore. They were dead. Because the blood and the life of Christ was flowing in them. It was not just a mere man anymore. The life that is in God began to flow in us once we begin to partake of the communion. It's on record that the man of God, um, Smith Wigglesworth, 
was a man that partook of the communion on a daily, daily basis. Daily basis. And the man was known as the apostle of faith. Enjoying the same order of life that Jesus Christ enjoyed upon this, upon, upon this earth. This is a mystery that we must not take for granted. It's a weapon that we must not take for granted. You see, the funny thing about the world is this. If you tell them to do something, they will do it religiously. To the letter. According to the instruction prescribed by whoever did it or told them to do it. But in the Christendom, we find it funny. It's so funny in the sense that um, what we are told to do, we take it with levity because we are so familiar with God or so familiar with the things of God that we simply just do whatever we think is right without any form of thinking within us. And we don't take the things of God seriously. I remember the story the General Vasi of the Redeemed Christian Church of God shared. He said, um, there's this priest three-piece suit that, they, that we wear within the African tradition. It's called um, the flowing gown. And then when you put on the flowing gown, you know, he's quite big and he's, he's maneuvering is kind of difficult. Now, he said he heard the Lord say, put on seven of them at the same time and start dancing. And then he told them that after he has finished dancing, that the Lord told him to lay on the floor. He said, then lay your hand upon it. He said, touch it rather. He said, the Lord said, nobody should grab hold of these, of these gowns. Simply just touch it. And then, you know, our people, somebody has to be disobedient and shown as the scapegoat. So one person decided to grab hold of it instead of it touch it. Maybe he didn't hear the instruction or maybe he thought the instruction was a joke. And then he began to shake began to shake uncontrollably for several hours it began to shake and shake and shake until the man of god was called to pray what am i saying when we are given spiritual instruction that pertains to life and godliness please by the grace of god or by the message of god i beseech you that please take it with seriousness because it is for our wellness and our goodness and our promotion and our moving forward god does not joke with what he's saying is serious about his words that's why he said not a single jot of the word i speak will come back to me unfulfilled so we can take this further down and begin to take this in our study how do we take the communion now we check the scriptures and we understand that communion requires self-examination paul speaking in the books of um corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 to 27 and it says there it says for i have received from the lord what also i have passed unto you how do we partake of the communion? The communion requires that we take a serious self-examination of ourselves. Without a thorough examination of ourselves, we might be vulnerable to manipulation of the devil. For example, we have Judas in the scriptures who partook of the communion and immediately the Bible says the devil entered into him. So a thorough examination is needed before you partake of the communion. Paul speaking in the books of um, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 27. He said, For I received from the Lord what I have passed unto you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in, mem in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the blood, the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until you come. But let every man examine himself, so that let him eat the bread and drink the cup of the cup. For who we eat and drink the blood the, and drinks in an unworthy manner, eat and drink unto judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So it's important that each and every one of us we partake of the communion in a in a mindset that is sober or in a sober mindset rather that we are aware of the implication and the spiritual things behind it like i said we must not take it with levity and just think it's just one of those religious things that we do and just a sunday or midweek service snack that we have or sunday service snack that we have because there are things that work behind it that goes into play once you begin to partake of the communion now, an internal examination is needed. 
and external ones also needed because you need to make sure that you are right with your friend because no man is an island and don't forget we all belong to the body of Christ so check with your neighbors make sure that you don't offer yourself as a living sacrifice before the Lord if you are not yet right with your neighbor and also the communion also means you're looking forward because you're proclaiming, proclaiming his death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. Every one of us require an internal, an external, and a future examination. What is past is past. But what we have right now, let our conscience be purged so that we don't eat unto condemnation. I want us to understand this so that because I don't want the word of God to stand against us on judgment day as a result of ignorance or unbelief of the word of God which has been spoken to us today. Now let's take this further down and begin to ask ourselves more question. Who should partake of the communion? Who should partake of the communion? There are no definite, definite, uh, there's no definite definition I was going to say in the scriptures of who is required or what requirement is needed. The only requirement I would say is that you cannot partake of the nature of Christ or the body and the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ except you are truly born again. So you must have accepted the Lord as your Lord and Savior. And there are not necessarily any classes that you have to attend except that you are a fully bonified child of God. And once that is in place, then you have nothing that is holding you back. There was no requirement by, the, by Jesus Christ for his disciples to speak in tongues before they begin to partake of the communion. After all, the Holy Ghost was not even released at that point in time because he has not ascended. So it's important that we are not cajoled to doing anything that we are not, uh, that's not scriptural. That's why I encourage all believers to make sure you study. Now, I've often said that there's no mountain anywhere. If you believe that I've taught you something that is wrong, go back to the scriptures. That's why I often give you scriptures to always, always go through to understand. It's to give you better understanding of the topic that we are going through. The communion is something that we do regularly. Because the Bible says that we should do it often in remembrance of me. It's not something that you do once in a while. Often, I believe it requires a regular occurrence. Maybe three times a week, four times a week. Every church has its own doctrine and I accept that. Some people is once a month, some people is once every quarter, some people is weekly, once a week. But when you define the word often, I believe often means as many times as possible. So I believe with this understanding, each and every one of us would take or change our approach to what how we view the communion. Now let me say this as I begin to close. The communion is a sacred meal. That each and every one of us should begin to appropriate in the right way and not misuse it. It is for purging of us of our conscience, for the healing of our body, for delivering us from the strongholds of sin and immorality, for the refreshment of our spirit man. So don't allow yourself to be shortchanged for whatever reason, because we lack understanding in certain areas. This is the mystery that the enemy does not want us to know. Remember, Jesus Christ was speaking to the lady at the well. He said, if you know who is standing before you, he said, you will ask of me to give you the water that never quenches, that never runs dry. And then the woman was thinking, he said, well, is the, isn't the water that you don't even have anything to draw water from the well? And he's talking about the Spirit of God. And we know the story in the books of John chapter 4. You can read verse 10 onwards. I was just using as an example to illustrate the point that there is more to just eating a snack in the church than what we are currently enjoying as a benefit of it. And if you cannot um, understand why you're doing it, you are not motivated to do it. That's why I've taken the time to begin to show us what are the things that are behind it. I believe that you have been blessed by the word of the Lord today. And I want you to begin to take the communion regularly. And you begin to see the changes in your life dramatically in so many aspects of it. Things that you used to struggle with, you just find yourself that is a walkover for you. And this shall be your testimony in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? My Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I give you glory and honor. I bless your holy name. 
I magnify you because you are faithful. Thank you for the mystery of your word today that you have revealed unto us. We magnify you because you are able and there is no one like you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. My Father and my God, I pray as your people begin to partake of the communion today, Lord God of heaven, open our eyes of understanding, reveal the mysteries of the word unto us, purge our heart of every evil conscience, and I pray that you deliver us from every stronghold of sin. And I pray there shall be refreshing in our spirit to the glory and praise of your holy name. The word that we have heard today shall not stand against us on judgment day. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. Thank you.